13 years ago yesterday, the completion of the Human Genome Project was announced. That project intended to provide us with an avenue towards personalized care. It took 13 years to accomplish that goal. It took 13 years and more than $3 billion to sequence four people. <clears throat> Our latest version of the Human Genome Assembly is made up of 13 people from Buffalo, New York. So I would ask, do you think that represents the variation that we would find in our population? Does that represent what we would expect to find when we looked at you and me and everyone else in terms of personalized medicine? Are we doing as much as we possibly can to bring that personalized medicine idea to fruition? So we've heard about it recently. The president has made an initiative that we're going to get involved in personalized medicine. We're going to sequence a million people, and we're going to find out how to cure disease. <clears throat> but the fact of the matter is, for the last, say, 100 years or so, we have been engaged in a system of accurate medicine. And accurate medicine is a good bit short of where I would hope to have medicine by this point in time. So <clears throat> quite often, we would use an analogy of we're targeting disease. I'm targeting a particular syndrome, a particular disease. So if I was really, really good as a physician, where would I want to be on this target? I'd want to be right in the middle, right? And I'd want to hit it on every single patient that I saw. But we all know you go to the doctor, you get a prescription, you get a series of tests, and somewhere on this, somewhere on this target is where we land. Sometimes we're lucky enough and we hit it right in the middle. Sometimes we're not quite as accurate and we get a little bit on the outside. Sometimes we're well off the mark and sometimes we're nowhere near the mark. So what does that mean for us? That means that we're not really doing quite the job that we set out to do. And <clears throat> what I'd like to see us move towards is not so much an error of, of personalized medicine, but one of precision medicine where we adopt tools that are available to us that came as a result of that Human Genome Project. And that Human Genome Project, although expensive, gave us a tremendous amount of information about who we are, what we are, how disease develops. And <clears throat> these are the faces of precision medicine. These are your friends, your family, your neighbors, your coworkers. These are the people that as a provider or a physician or a scientist or Everybody in the room that's engaged in healthcare, these are the people you're trying to affect. These are the people you're trying to make better with the choices that you're, you're making in the physician's office or you're making at the pharmacy or you're making in the laboratory. Every one of these people had some disease process that needed to be addressed on a personal level. And the way it is now, we somewhat lump treatment into, into a big umbrella. For some people, it's going to work great, just like that target. It's going to hit them right on the right spot. It's going to cure their disease. It's going to affect them dramatically. For other people, it's well off the mark. So what I'd like to do today is tell you a little bit about some of the tools that are available to us and some of the tools that I'm, I'm hopeful we're going to adopt and we're going to embrace in a move towards precision medicine. <clears throat> So we heard earlier today uh, some discussion about pharmacogenetics. I don't think the term was necessarily used. But if you go to the physician and they write a prescription for you, there is a fairly high probability that that drug's not going to work for you on the first try, that that's not the right drug for you. Now, that may be the first drug of choice. So maybe in a large population of people, the drug company says, we've looked at 10,000 people, and this works well for a fair number of them. But how many? 20%, 30%, does that strike the target like we're hoping? 20% is not what I want. If I go to my doctor and he, gives me a he or she gives me a prescription, I'd like for them to give me the one that's going to work for me and the dosage that's going to work for me at the right time. So <clears throat> we have sometimes the perception that pharmacogenetics is new, that it's a technology that's just come of age, that we've just discovered this new this new way of looking at people, when in fact it's been around since the late 1950s. 
So we've had pharmacogenetics, the idea that each of us metabolizes drugs differently for the last 60 plus years. And yet we haven't adopted it as a major part of clinical practice. We're not using those tools to the best ability. So <clears throat> our laboratory looks at a number of different liver expressed enzymes. And these up here, this is three examples of the cytochrome P450 family of proteins. There's 50 of them. We're looking at just a handful of them. And these are the ones that primarily are responsible for metabolizing the drugs that we take. So probably a good number, 70% or more, of those drugs that are on the market right now are being metabolized through one of these cytochromes. And if you look at the pie charts here, you can see that there are a few of them that there's a high percentage of normals. So let's just say the 2C9. 69% of people, 68% of people are normal. That's good if you're in the 69%. It's not so good if you're not in the 69%. Dr. Balzer earlier today mentioned the drug called clopidogrel, clopidogrel or Plavix. That's run by the 2C19. There's only 42% of people that are normal. There's a variety of other types of metabolic activity that comes from that. So people can be rapid, they can be slow, they can be intermediate. All of that impacts whether or not they're going to be uh, medicated properly with that particular drug. And then the 2D6, that speaks to our last speaker with pain. Many of the pain drugs go through 2D6. So choosing the right pain medication for a patient is also important, right? We want to alleviate that pain as much as possible. We want to make it go away if, if we can. But we can't do so without understanding how that patient's going to metabolize the drug, whether they will metabolize it at all. What happens in the population? Which people are going to respond to the drug, which people are not going to respond to the drug, when should you do the testing, when should you change the drug. So we're engaged in trying to better understand this um, for a variety of different drugs. Our current testing protocol can provide some level of guidance on nearly 300 different drugs. There are 70 drugs that have direct FDA guidance. So those are, those are drugs that have a black box or have a warning that says you must be doing this type of genetic testing to ensure that this drug is appropriate for this patient. That's significant because as it turns out, most physicians are either unaware of that or they don't order it. And why don't they order it? In the past, it's been expensive. It's too expensive. It's too hard to understand. I don't understand it. The patient doesn't understand it. But we need to get past those hurdles. We need to be able to adopt this kind of technology so that the patient can understand what's the best drug for them and what the physician needs to prescribe for that patient to do their best for that patient as well. One of the other technologies that we have, have implemented quite extensively is next generation sequencing. So this is the next step beyond where we were with whole genome sequencing back in 2003. NGS now allows us to do that for just a couple thousand dollars, well within the reach of everybody. And I think the patient, just as a physician, needs to be an active participant in this. The patient can take hold of that genetic information. They can take hold of that knowledge about which drug is best for them, which drug is not the best for them. So we have a, a large number of patients that have, that have done the pharmacogenetic studies with us. We have patients who are actively participating in a variety of different studies that we have for next gen sequencing. And that includes patients that may have autism, patients that have brain cancer, patients that, are have, that have transplant rejection. And we're trying to better understand which genes are involved in the disease process, which genes can be used to provide a better therapy which genes can be used to provide more information about prognosis. So what can be done through next-gen sequencing is we can look at the entire complement of that person, that patient, look at all 23,000 genes, and we can do an analysis of that, and we can determine, does this patient have a risk factor for a particular disease? Do they have a genetic break in a gene that's contributing to the disease? And we can do that on the whole genome level. We're looking at every bit of information that we can get from that. We're looking at that person's blueprint, that person's uh, encyclopedia, who they, who, who they are and what makes them up. We can also go one step down or one step deeper, and we can look at the 4,600 genes that represent the clinical exome. Those are the genes that we know have some association with disease. 
So that can be done, and we can give you a roadmap for what your genetic blueprint looks like in terms of disease. By no means does that guarantee that you're going to have a disease, but it may speak to the fact that maybe you have things that would push you towards that, along with environmental influences and a number of other things. Your genetics can be tweaked. We heard earlier about the epigenetics. There are things that can happen to your genetics that promote it down the direction of disease. But it's very useful to know, do I have a risk factor? So we've heard in the last couple of years about BRCA, breast cancer. So risk of breast cancer related to BRCA gene. So everyone, men and women, could get tested for BRCA. That doesn't guarantee they're going to get breast cancer, but it certainly provides some information to themselves and to the physician that I need to watch this. This is something I need to be proactive with myself. We can go one step further than that, and we can look at NGS in terms of targeted diseases. So let's just say, for example, you're doing testing for cystic fibrosis. You have a brand new newborn baby, and you want to make sure that they don't have a risk for cystic fibrosis. So we can sequence that specific gene and look for mutations or alterations in that gene that will allow us to know that there is a risk or there is not a risk, and what the severity, perhaps, of the disease may be. So if you take these two first tools, you take pharmacogenetics and you take sequencing, what can you do with it? Apart from having the knowledge that maybe you have a, a risk factor, apart from the knowledge that maybe you have a break in a specific gene, now what? What can we do about it? For some things like cancer, I mean, routinely there are cancers that are sequenced, and we look to see whether they have mutations in proto-oncogenes or tumor suppressor genes, whether they'll respond to certain types of medications that have been engineered to target that gene deficit. That's one way we can use it, right? And that's a pretty common way. Physicians have adopted that. That happens all the time. If you go to an oncologist and they diagnose you with a specific type of tumor, they will take a sample, they send it off, it gets sequenced, it comes back. But does it get used? I, I, I spoke to a physician maybe a year or so ago, an oncologist, and I asked him if he used it. Have you, have you sequenced? Do you routinely sequence your patients? And he says, yes, I do. I sequence those patients, and I take that report, and I put it in my pocket. And if they fail therapy, then I'll look at it. Is that the right way of doing it? No, you had information in your pocket that would tell you that that patient would or wouldn't respond. You could have done the same thing with the pharmacogenetics. There are a number of chemotherapy drugs that process through those same enzymes. So you could have done the genetics of the tumor, you could have done the genetics of the patient, and you could have determined, do I know what's wrong with this tumor? Do I know what the break is? And number two, do I know the best drug for the patient? If I give them the standard course of therapy, if I give them the frontline gold standard protocol, and many of you know if you're in the medical field or if you're in oncology, you know that some of those protocols have a 60-40 split. Got a 60% chance of getting it right on the first try. I, for one, I, I hope and pray that I'm in the 60%, but I'd much rather be in the 100%. I'd rather, much rather know what's wrong with the tumor and what drug is going to work for me. So there, there's a little bit of a barrier in, in the usage of the technology, and that's why the title of my talk was Embracing It. Technology's there. It's well within our reach. We are we don't have any real restraints from using it anymore. It's affordable, it's more affordable, it's certainly not gonna cost you $750 million to get yourself sequenced. It's a couple thousand dollars. Insurance companies are starting to come around a little bit more with reimbursement of some of these genes. So say the cancer genes, for example, they do pay for it. But what about for heart disease? What about for diabetes? What about for stroke? Uh, what about for Alzheimer's? Uh, those are not covered. So back to my question before, what do we do about it? We understand now where the gene is, what may be broken about it. Maybe we understand what drugs this particular patient could, could tolerate, but what can we do about it? There's some recent technologies that would allow us to do some genetic engineering. Now, this is not a new idea either. The genetic engineering has been around for 30 or 40 years. Initially, it started in patients that had cystic fibrosis. And the idea was, well, let's figure out a way of introducing the correct gene back into this patient so that we can fix what's wrong with them. 
So that's the FTR gene that's broken in cystic fibrosis patients. They looked at it in the lab. They found the correct, normal, healthy version of it, engineered it into an adenovirus, which is a virus like a cold virus, and it nebulized it into the patient. So they had him breathe it in in kind of one of those mist machines with the hope that it would in integrate and insert the correct gene into the lung tissue. And it works to a degree. Problem is it doesn't always hit the right place in the cell. It doesn't hit the right type of cell. And over a period of time, it just gets kicked out because it doesn't really belong. So this is a newer technology. This is a gene switch. So this is a switchable. You can turn it on and you can turn it off. So up here on the left-hand side, we see the DNA and the normal gene for, for CFTR, for example. If that gene is normal, it produces this protein that you see here in the middle left. If it's broken, then it does not produce that protein. In this case, it would be a chloride channel. It doesn't produce that protein, so the patient starts to have symptoms. They get clogged up, clogged up, clogged up lungs. They have digestive problems. They have all number of issues. But let's say we're able to excise that damaged gene out. We can cut it out. And there are enzymes that serve as molecular scissors that can go in there and clip out that bad gene and insert a good gene. So in this case, we go and we find that defective gene. We use those molecular scissors to cut it out. And we insert in a clean, normal, healthy gene. But we insert it along with a switch. And this allows us to control the gene allows us to turn it on and turn it off, turn it on in specific tissues if we wanted to. So we've inserted this selectable, switchable gene. It's now integrated into that person's lung cells, and we can turn it on and turn it off when we need to. We can only turn it on in the lungs if we want. We can turn it on in just parts of the lung if we wanted to. And that can be done by a variety of different drugs and, and proteins. And the way that this works ideally is if you take a protein that's not human. So the way this has been done in the lab is they're using an insect gene, a gene for molting. Obviously, it doesn't exist in humans. So you put that switch in there, and when you provide the right protein, it turns on the gene and alleviates the symptomology of the disease. Clever way of doing it. Perhaps one thing we can do in the near future here is that will be uh, a product that you can go to your pulmonologist and you can get. Another thing that we've probably heard quite a bit about, I mean, it, it has been in the news, and uh, that is CRISPR. And CRISPR is a way of gene editing, a very powerful way of gene editing. So the reasons to consider these types of technologies is to come back to those patients that we're trying to target, the friends, the family, the neighbors, the people you care about, the people you see in the mirror every morning. So I'd, I'd, like to, I'd like to ask everybody that you take your own initiative in trying to take hold of your own health, share that with the physician, and let's begin to try to embrace some of the technologies that are available to us now. Thank you.